Electricity is one of our most faithful servants. It gives us light. It starts our cars, has unlimited in aviation, circle globe with entertainment. It cooks and refrigerates our food. These represent few of the innumerable applications of electricity. Electricity at work. But what is electricity, and where does it come from? To answer these questions, let's look in on the world of electrons. The entire universe is composed of matter. A basic concept of the structure of matter is essential for the understanding of electricity, because the very force that holds matter together has an electrical nature. There are many different substances each a combination of some of the 92 known chemical elements. Just as yeast, flour, salt, sugar, and shortening are the ingredients used in making bread, so are the 92 elements the ingredients of all matter. And if one of these elements is reduced to its purest final form, its smallest unit would be an atom. No one has ever seen inside an atom. However, we think of it as a system of electrons circulating around a heavy nucleus at almost inconceivable speeds. In order to explain the principles with which we are concerned in this story, let's assume that we can stop the action within the atom. And further, let's acknowledge that this is a symbol representing the atom and not an attempt to show it as it actually is. It is impossible to show the correct relative proportions of an atom on this screen. For example, if an atom could be as large as the United States, one of its electrons would be only about 100 feet across. Therefore, to tell our story, we must resort to a symbol. Then we can think of the atom as being a group of relatively light, small particles arranged around a heavy nucleus. These are particles of electric energy. The lighter ones, the electrons, are negative electric charges. And the heavier one, the nucleus, carries positive charges. Normally, a state of balance is maintained within the atom by a positive charge in the nucleus equal to the total negative charge of the electrons. And when the atom contains its normal number of electrons, it is said to be in electrical balance, to be in a neutral electrical condition. It is possible, however, to disturb this normal balance, whereupon the unbalanced atom assumes an electric charge. Too many electrons will produce a negative charge. Too few will throw the balance onto the positive side. In order to visualize better the effect of this, let's introduce a color code in which the positive charge, or an absence of electrons, is represented with red and the negative charge, a predominance of electrons, with blue. Then an object that is in electrical balance will be purple, an equal part of each of the positive and negative charges. We have been concerned so far with the electrons within individual atoms. Now let's see what happens when two or more neutral atoms come together the outside electrons will no longer move exclusively within their original atoms, but will circulate about both atoms at once. And if we bring many such atoms close together, as in a piece of metal, then many electrons detach themselves from their original atoms and move freely throughout the metal. As long as the metal has its normal number of electrons, it is electrically neutral. 
But like an individual atom, it can lose some of its electrons and become positively charged. Or it can pick up more than its normal number of electrons to become negatively charged. The electrons always try to get from a negatively charged body to one that is positively charged in relation to it. And if they are brought together, the electrons will flow from one to the other until both objects are equally charged. The establishment of unbalanced charges in matter is, in all instances, the principle of the generation of electricity. To illustrate further this principle, let's analyze the action within a cell, a simple source of electric energy. A piece of zinc is suspended in a suitable container. Its atoms are neutral until a chemical solution is added. Then some of the zinc atoms go into the solution, leaving a few of their electrons behind in the metal. The zinc becomes strongly negatively charged. Now a piece of electrically neutral copper is put in a chemical solution in another container. The copper will become very weakly negative. Since the copper has a smaller negative charge, it is positive with respect to the zinc. And if the two metals are connected, the electrons will surge from the zinc to the copper and the charges will become equalized. This momentary current has little practical value. However, if we now connect the solutions, the charges in the solutions will become equalized and the metals or terminals will be charged. We will then have an unbalanced condition of the electrons in the metals capable of producing a continuous flow of useful electric current. All of the work performed by electricity requires a flow of current. So let's see what principles are involved when current flows. There are three related to flow of electricity. They are pressure or voltage, current intensity, and resistance. First, let us consider pressure. With nature always trying to maintain an electrical balance, there is a tendency for any negatively charged object to throw off or repel its excess of electrons, and for a positively charged object to attract electrons. This urge to maintain an electrical balance is potential electric energy. And since this potential energy is a repelling and attracting urge caused by opposite charges, its force or pressure is equal to the difference in the charges. It is called the difference in potential or potential difference. The unit of pressure or potential difference is the volt. The voltage then is always the potential difference at the negative and positive terminals of the source of the electric energy. It represents the difference between the number of extra electrons at the two terminals. And when a suitable path is provided, the potential difference causes the electrons or current to flow from one terminal through the conductor to the other terminal. To explain how this works, let's review the action of the atoms and their electrons in a piece of metal where we saw swarms of electrons moving freely in all directions about the atoms. Substances in which this takes place are good conductors of electricity. If an outside electric pressure or voltage is applied to a conductor, the electrons will move predominantly in one direction. The effect is that electrons move from the negative to the positive terminal. This is the electric current. The unit of electric current is the ampere. One amp, now hold on to your hat, six billion, three hundred million billion electrons passing any given point in one second. Current or amperage then is the number of electrons that pass a given point 
in a given time. And now the third factor, resistance. This factor is controlled by the nature of the material through which the electrons flow. Again, going back to the motion of electrons in a metal, we said that they moved freely about and among the atoms. However, even in the best of conductors, some of the electrons collide with the atoms, tending to retard the movement of the electrons. This is the cause of electric resistance. Collisions are more probable in some metals than in others. Therefore, different metals offer different degrees of resistance to the flow of electrons. For example, copper has low resistance. It permits the electrons to flow freely with few collisions and is therefore a good conductor. Iron offers more resistance than copper. Collisions with the atoms are more frequent. In some substances, no electrons are free to move around as in the metal. All of the electrons stay with their atoms so that no current can flow. These substances are the insulators, glass, porcelain, rubber, and many others. The collisions that the electrons have with the atoms set the atoms into more violent vibration. This makes the metal hotter. If there are enough of these collisions, the metal will radiate heat and light. Heat and light from electrical sources, then, can be obtained as the result of resistance in some metals. The unit of resistance is the ohm. Its value is best understood when its relation to the other factors is explained. A pressure of one volt produces a current of one ampere through a resistance of one ohm. Whatever the source or the magnitude of electric energy, these factors always have the same relation to each other. So, in order to supply our great demands for electric power, we must have facilities for generating great currents at sufficient pressures to overcome the resistance of the lines, as well as to do the work. Power for industry, transportation, and light, as well as for many other conveniences we use in our daily lives. Our own sources of current able to perform these amounts of work are the electromagnetic generators. In order to explain the manner in which electricity is produced by electromagnetic generators and used in most electrical machinery, let's have a look at magnets and magnetic fields. The Earth itself is a magnet. So are the tiny electrons. All of the electrons in any object are tiny magnets. When a predominant number of these tiny magnets point in one direction, we have an extremely small magnetized block called a magnetic domain. Magnetic material, that is, material capable of being magnetized is made up of such domains pointing in all directions. When these domains all point in the same direction, we have a magnet. In some materials, such as copper, the tiny magnets of the electrons never line up. These materials are non-magnetic, cannot be magnetized. Every magnet has a magnetic field. Magnets may be made in various shapes to provide convenient and strong fields. To understand how a magnetic field is useful in the generation or application of electricity, 
Let's go back to the electron, Mr. Electron, and watch him move across the magnetic field. Will you do it again, bud? Now notice, as he enters the magnetic field, he's deflected from his original course. His deflection depends upon his velocity. Now, as we have previously shown, conductors have many free electrons. And if a conductor is moved across a magnetic field, the mechanical action causes the electrons in the wire to be deflected, just as we saw Mr. Electron deflected. This, in effect, establishes a negative and a positive charge at the ends of the conductor. We now have two charge terminals capable of producing a continuous flow of electric current just as we had in the cell. This is accomplished in practice by providing a means of continuing the movement of a conductor within a magnetic field. In all electromagnetic generators, regardless of size, the same principle is used to generate electricity. The deflection of electrons in a conductor moving across a magnetic field. The same magnetic fields and forces are also used in making an electric current perform useful mechanical work. Remember that an electron moving across a magnetic field is deflected. If the electron were moving in a wire, as when electric current flows, the deflection of the electron would cause it to push against the wire, tending to move the wire. Billions upon billions of these tiny pushes combine to provide the force. The stronger the current, or the greater number of electrons, the greater the force moving the wire. These forces on current carrying wires in magnetic fields furnish the power for all electric motors. From the simplest to the most complex, from the smallest to the largest electric motors, the principle is the same. The deflection of electrons flowing in current carrying wires by magnetic fields. In fact, interaction between the magnetic fields and the electrons is the basis of all electric devices. And now we may summarize that the billions and billions of atoms of which the universe is built are composed of positive and negative electric charges. That these charges are normally balanced in matter. That by unbalancing these charges, electric energy is made available. That the urge of nature to restore this balance creates electric pressure. And that the response to this urge, the action of the restoration of the balance is a flow of electric current. The flow of electric current, then, is simply the movement of electrons away from objects that have acquired a negative charge to objects whose charge is relatively positive. It's this principle that has made possible the countless electric devices which contribute to the comfort and fulfillment of richer and happier living today. Devices which will expand that to unlimited horizons in the future. Devices whose operation is dependent upon nature's design for matter. Demanding that matter itself shall always seek a state of new electrical balance. You're watching Sleepcore, Pleasant Dreams. Meet 
Mr. Archimedes of ancient Greece. Long ago, Archie said, Give me a lever long enough and I can move the world. What Archimedes meant was that the power of a lever is practically unlimited. Today, almost everyone uses some form of lever in his daily work. The familiar can opener is a lever with a sharp cutting edge. The playground seesaw is just a simple lever too. It takes a lot of force to start a freight car moving, yet the railroad man can start the heaviest freight cars easily with a pinch bar, a powerful lever which turns the wheel. Tough luck, old boy. Here's a place where a lever comes in mighty handy. Let's take the simplest kind of lever, a rigid bar working on a fixed support called a fulcrum. One end of this lever is twice as long as the other. Let's put a 10 pound weight on this end and now we'll put half as much weight on this end. Five pounds, balance 10. If we have 25 pounds to lift, we just use a longer lever. The five pounds will now balance five times as much. Let's raise the lever in the air, change its shape a little, and we have a crank. Or we can add a second lever and have a double crank. Now the short arm moves one fourth the distance, but we get four times the force. If we want continuous motion, we need more arms. Now we have levers that turn. The larger paddle wheel makes fewer turns, but it delivers more force. A paddle wheel is nothing but a never-ending series of levers. We can make the wheels stronger and lessen friction where the wheels touch each other by rounding off the edges and shaping them into teeth that will slide in and out smoothly. Now, the power flows smoothly and continuously through spinning leverage of gear wheels. Gears are made in many kinds and many sizes. Little gears, big gears, worm gears, bevel gears, and even lopsided gears. Over a hundred million gears are spinning over the roads in the transmissions of our automobiles. The transmission is located right at the bottom of the gear shift lever. Let's start from scratch and put together a model of the gears that we shift in our motor car. The shaft on the left comes from the engine. The shaft on the right carries the power back to the rear wheels. To connect these two with gears, we'll need another shaft, known as a counter shaft. These two gears carry the power from the engine shaft to the counter shaft and are always connected or in mesh. This gear on the drive shaft going to the wheels is free to turn around the shaft. We'll put it in mesh with another gear on the counter shaft. These gears are always in mesh. And keep turning while the engine is running. To switch from one set of gears to another, our transmission needs a short shaft like this, known as a clutch sleeve. It cannot turn on the drive shaft, but it is free to slide back and forth. On the sleeve, we'll mount a large gear, which we can shift back and forth to mesh with the small gear in the middle of the counter shaft. We are now in neutral. The gears that are always in mesh are turning over with the engine, but the shaft to the rear wheels is standing still. A 3,000 pound automobile takes a lot of force to start. So in low speed, we get the greatest leverage by letting the smallest gear on the counter shaft turn the largest gear on the drive shaft. The engine on this model is running at a constant speed of 90 revolutions a minute. With low gears in mesh, the rear wheel is turning at 30 revolutions a minute, about a third the speed of the engine, but with three times the force. The power is going through these gears in the transmission.
After we've started the car rolling, we want fast pickup. So we shift into second by sliding the sleeve backward to mesh with this gear on the shaft to the rear wheels. The wheel is now turning at 60 revolutions a minute and the power flows through these gears. For higher speeds, we let the power go directly to the rear wheels. We shift the sleeve forward so that it meshes with the shaft from the engine. The power travels straight from the engine to the drive shaft. Now the shaft to the wheels is turning at 90 revolutions a minute, the same speed as the engine. But here's a problem. An automobile must be able to go backward as well as forward. So we add one more set of gears to reverse the shaft to the rear wheels. With the gears shifted into reverse, the power travels through the transmission in a path like this. We now have three sets of spinning levers for going forward and one for reverse. With a gear shift lever, we can shift to any set of gears we wish. But with all these spinning levers in the transmission came noise and wear. Experts could shift gears quietly by careful timing of the gear shift and the engine speeds, but most of us made plenty of noise until new engineering developments made possible the long series of improvements that followed. When we shifted gears, we got a clash because the gears were not running at the same speed. In other words, not synchronized. So engineers set to work to develop a synchronizer. The synchronizer works like a cork twisted into the top of a bottle. The cork will turn until it is so tight that the bottle turns with it. Synchro mesh works the same way. When we shift into second or high, the synchronizer brings the gears to the same speed before they come together. The drums won't let the gears shift unless they are turning at the same speed. When the gears come together, there is no clash and the shift is made quietly and easily. In the transmission of the up-to-date automobile, we have a powerful low gear to give us a strong spinning leverage in starting. A fast turning motor must set the weight of the car in motion. In second speed, we can change leverage to get going fast at the same engine speed. With the leverage of third gear, power goes directly to the rear wheels and we can go as fast as we want. Now every driver can shift gears at any time, regardless of speed. Here is a hill that will give us a real chance to see how smoothly and reliably our spinning levers work in our automobile transmission. This driver is going to let her car gain a speed of 60 miles an hour down the hill. Then she will shift into second speed and bring her car easily and safely under control before it reaches the bottom of the hill. You're watching Sleepcore. Media for Insomnia. People who live in glass houses can't keep secrets. But a goldfish doesn't seem to care that his life is an open book, that his days are spent in a glare of publicity. With fish below the ocean, it used to be a different matter. Deep in the ocean, a fish could feel safe from prying eyes. 
And now all that's been changed by underwater photography. Today, even sea monsters are standing in line to have their pictures taken. In night black waters, never warmed by the sun, is a world of fantastic life. Here, for example, is the rosy feathered starfish dancing jitterbug of the ocean floor. Another queer creature dangles little fishing lines from his body to attract and to catch smaller bits of submarine life. The beautiful girdle of Venus is almost completely transparent. Many of these deep sea citizens have never before been seen in their natural form because when they are taken suddenly to the surface, they explode. The reason for this is that the fish have built up tremendous pressure inside to balance the pressure of the water outside. This outside pressure is, of course, due to the weight of water above. 2,000 feet down, the fish have to sustain a force of almost 1,000 pounds on each square inch of their skin. The deeper the water, the higher the pressure. A fish would have to resist a water pressure of more than seven tons on each square inch in order to live six miles down in the deepest part of the ocean. Just imagine holding two elephants on one finger. Suppose we were to live on the bottom of an ocean. How would we feel under pressure? Let's ask someone who actually does live 24 hours a day, every day of the year, right down on the ocean floor. Let's ask this man here. He ought to be able to tell us. Hey, mister, how does it feel down there at the bottom of the ocean? Bottom of the ocean? Say, are you feeling all right? What ocean? Why, the ocean of air, the one we're at the bottom of right now. Look up. What do you see? Well, I see just air. You see air. What does it look like? Well, it's uh, just, well, it's blue. Sorry, but it isn't. If you were up there far enough, the sky would be black all around you. Fact is, you can't see air at all. That blueness, you see, is caused by dust, dust particles floating high in the air. The ocean of air goes up at least 50 miles and may go even higher. And all that air presses down on us just like water in the ocean presses down on the fish. Yes, mister, we are all living at the bottom of an ocean, an ocean of air at least 50 miles deep. There's lots and lots of air, and a good thing, too, because where would we be without it? We'd be in a vacuum, that's where we'd be. I got you that time. All right, what is a vacuum? <laughs> that's simple. A vacuum's the stuff that runs these windshield wipers. Oh, it is, is it? Well, just how does it do it? Why, uh... Aha, try again. What is a vacuum? Well, I guess it's just nothing. If that's the case, then how can nothing run those windshield wipers? Well, you tell me. All right, I will. It's air pressure that runs those windshield wipers. The vacuum is a control, a way of putting the air pressure all around us to work. How do you suppose, for instance, that you breathe? Well, I just... Pull the air into my lungs. It's simple once you learn the trick. I've known how ever since I was a baby. Sorry, but you're on the wrong track again. You really use the same principle that makes the engine in your car breathe. Makes my car breathe? Sure, your car uses vacuum control to make the normal air pressure all around force the air and gasoline into the carburetor and the engine. This is how it works. Each of the six cylinders in your engine acts as a pump, just as your chest muscles do. When a piston in the engine moves down, it makes more space inside the cylinder. A little smoke will show how the air rushes in to fill that empty space, with all the weight of the ocean of air behind it. So that's the way you and your car breathe. We can see another result of this pressure around us, about 15 pounds on each square inch if we put a toy balloon inside a jar. 
we can add a little smoke to make the movement of the air in the jar visible. Now, if we connect the jar to the vacuum inside the engine, we can take most of the air out of the jar. That takes the pressure away from the outside of the balloon. Then the air inside the balloon expands and makes the balloon bigger. Remember, the fish would explode if they were taken up where the pressure is low. Now, here's a way we can get this air pressure all around us, squeezing in from every direction with a force of 15 pounds in every square inch to do work for us. We can connect a small chamber to the engine vacuum. Inside the chamber, dividing it into two sections, is a sliding plunger. A little valve can control the action so that we get a vacuum on one side of the plunger and normal pressure on the other side. Again, smoke will show how it works. When we move the valve a little bit, we apply the engine vacuum to one side of the plunger. The normal air pressure in the other side of the chamber will give the plunger a strong push. We can reverse the effect to get a strong push in the opposite direction by simply moving the valve to apply the vacuum to the other side of the chamber. Notice how the smoke shows the air moving in and out as the vacuum changes sides. And notice that almost no effort at all is required to move the valve. The air does all the pushing. The plunger follows the slightest movement of the valve so that we get exact control of the air pressure. Now let's get practical and connect one of these vacuum chambers and plungers to the gear shifting mechanism of a motor car. Then we can operate the valve control with the gear shift lever. Of course, by using more effort, we could shift gears without the help of this control. But by letting air pressure do 80% of the work of shifting gears for us, we leave just enough for ourselves to get the feel of what we're doing. So that's why this jigger works so easy. You puzzled it out for yourself. And one thing you can always depend on, there's always air around you. Pressure that you don't have to pay for or carry around with you. Now you have to keep in mind the fact that getting this principle to work for you requires a difference in the pressures involved. And that brings up the subject of relativity, simply a question of applied dynamics and mechanics. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I don't get it. <laughs>